Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials, video 128, it's matter as a wave. In the last video, I showed how the work of Louis de Broglie suggested that matter might be made of waves, just like light is made of particles. And he even came up with de Broglie's wavelength, which is equal to Planck's constant divided by momentum, which is mass times velocity. The reason we don't see matter as a wave is that it has such a, a large mass compared to Planck's constant that the wavelength is so small that we don't really see it. But to show that it was a wave, a couple of scientists, Davison and Germer, devised a neat experiment where they showed interference as electrons were interfering with one another. Electrons are matter and they were behaving like waves. What are some implications of that? Well, an electron microscope uses that really small wavelength of electrons to see things that we couldn't see with visible light. And so matter is both a wave and a particle. It has wave-particle duality just like light. And so if we treat matter as a particle, that's classical mechanics. And if we treat it as a wave, that's quantum mechanics. But which world should we live in all depends on scale. If it's large, we call that classical mechanics and if it's very very small nanoscopic that's the world of quantum mechanics and de Broglie's wavelength is kind of a a determiner of which area we should be along this continuum and then the Davis and Germer experiment showed that he was actually right and so let's apply the de Broglie wavelength to a large object like a, a baseball and so it's equal to Planck's constant divided by momentum remember momentum is simply mass times velocity if I know the mass of the object the velocity of the object I simply plug those in and I get a de Broglie wavelength that is incredibly small 10 to the negative 34th to give you some sense of scale the diameter of a hydrogen atom is only 10 to the negative 11th and now we're dealing with 10 to the negative 34th and so this implies that the wavelength is so small that we essentially couldn't even measure it, couldn't even see it. But now instead of a baseball, let's look at an electron that's just moving through, through a simple circuit. It's got an incredibly small mass, a larger velocity, but let's plug that into our equation. And now we get a de Broglie wavelength that's going to be not as small. You know, since we've got momentum on the bottom, as we decrease the mass relative to Planck's constant, we get a wavelength that's going to be larger on the order of 0.12 nanometers. And as we move into the nanoscopic world, those nanometers, we're moving into wavelengths that are close to the wavelengths of visible light. Remember, visible light would be, you know, green light is going to be somewhere around 500 nanometers. And so that's why we have better resolution with an electron microscope, but it also means that we have to start treating small particles particles like electrons as a wave, not as a particle. So one thing that waves can do that particles can't is they can interfere. And so if I have two waves next to each other, as they oscillate, there are going to be certain areas where the waves will destructively interfere with each other. In other words, they're going to break each other down in areas where they're going to build each other up. And particles don't do that. They can't interfere. So Davis and Germer in their experiment were looking for interference in electrons. And so inside a vacuum chamber they had an electron gun that would produce an electron beam that would stripe a nickel target. Now, what was interesting is that nickel target built up some oxidation on it, so they put it in an oven, and inadvertently what they did is created one large crystal, which actually helped them get good results. As the electron hit the nickel, it would then scatter the electrons, and the electrons, they hoped, would interfere with one another. They had a movable detector that as it moved back and forth at different angles, they hoped it would receive different amounts of an electron, so there would be interference of those electron matter waves. And so if you visualize it like this, there are going to be along the pathway of that detector areas where we're going to have more electrons, areas where we're going to have elec less electrons. So they're looking for direct evidence that matter acts as a wave. And this is their data. They found at different angles they would have more or less amounts of this electric charge and therefore the electrons were interfering with one another. And so did you learn to, to predict the dependence of the de Broglie wavelength on both the mass and the velocity? And then can you see that the Davis and Germer experiment showed interference in electrons and therefore showed that those electrons matter were acting as waves? I hope so and I hope that was helpful.